This morning we're beginning a new series, a Christmas series, right? Imagine that. We're walking into Christmas time. And uh, I love a good story, don't you? Stories are awesome. They're wonderful. And throughout the years, throughout the ages, really, people have loved stories from, you know, just a tribal or a family circle gathered around the fire sharing the stories of their history and their past and stories about great things accomplished to more modern times as people love books and theater and movies and television and all the different ways that we can partake of a good story. Stories are are powerful and they relate the human experience. And so when we watch a story or we read a story, we engage with a story, it taps into our emotion, it taps into our own experience and we connect with it and we we feel with it and we, we share an experience together and it helps to connect past, present, and even our thoughts of the future and where we're going. And we relate to those stories as we try to understand our lives in this world. And the things that we experience and the things that we are going through. And some stories are true and others are legend. You know, they, they've been maybe modified a little bit over the time. But some of them are even just plain fiction. And stories that are meant to get us thinking or connect with our hearts and feelings. Now, personally, I agree with the statement that the truth is stranger than fiction. You know, the true stories are, are much, much more interesting and much stranger than fiction. And I love stories. And Christmas is a time of stories. And I, it would be interesting probably to poll around the room this morning, all of you here, what your favorite Christmas stories are. You know, you probably have stories you go back to at holiday time, maybe your favorite movie to watch. You know, I know there's lots of people that love, uh, you know, It's a Wonderful Life or Miracle on 34th Street or, or different Christmas stories. Maybe you like uh, The Gift of the Magi. You know, maybe you like some other compelling story. You know, maybe the books come out, you know, you like to read those. Um, We've got a a stock of really their kids Christmas books, but they're like my favorites. You know, one of my favorites is Mr. Willoughby's Christmas tree. You know, I don't know if you know that one or not, but that's like one of my favorites. But you know, the stories, Christmas, there's stories in that and stories that are, again, connecting those ideas and, and things that we have. Christmas itself is a story. And this story is a true story, and it's rooted in history, and it's a story of love and and betrayal and mercy and miracles and amazing things. It's a story that changed the world forever. It is our story, really. It's God's story as he brought that story to us. It's a story that everyone needs to hear because they're in it. It's the one overarching and undergirding story that is the truth behind all that we know and see and all that we experience, all that is yet to come. And it's true and it's compelling and it's the greatest story of all time. It's God's story and it's the gospel. Well, being someone that loves stories, I don't know how you are about stories. I don't know if any of you cheat and peek at the back of a book before you read the first part. I know some people that read the back because they want to know how it turns out before they're going to buy the book and read it. You know, if it's not going to turn out well, they don't they don't want to start, you know, so they just kind of peek ahead. But you're really not supposed to start at the back of the book. You're supposed to start at the beginning of the story. Right. That's that's where you begin. You don't pick it up and and start in the middle. You don't peek at the end, but you, you start at the beginning. And so even with this story of Christmas, where I want us to go, I hope we we look at it a little bit maybe fresh and new this year as we walk through the next few weeks together. But I want us to go back and start at the beginning because the baby born on that starry night and laid in a manger, that was not the beginning of the story. Now, he was there at the beginning, but that wasn't the beginning of the story. You know, the beginning of the book we recognize very well is in Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1, which says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? That's the beginning. That's where it all started. That's where it all happened. We can let our mind tilt with the idea about, well, what about before that? You know, because God always was. We'll have to wait and let God clear that one up for our our minds somewhere in the future. But for us, that's the beginning. God created it all. And what does that have to do with Christmas, you might ask? Well, I would answer everything, absolutely everything. In fact, I hope, as I said, you'll see that maybe in a little bit of a new way this year. Let's start from the beginning, only this time I want to read from John chapter 1, beginning in verse 1. And it says, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was with God in the beginning. 
And through him all things were made. Without him nothing was made that has been made. And in him was life, and that life was the light of men. The light shines in the darkness, but the darkness has not understood it. Skipping down to verse 9, it says, The true light that gives light to every man was coming into the world. And he was in the world, and though the world was made through him, the world did not recognize him. He came to that which was his own, but his own did not receive him. Yet to all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. Verse 14 says, the word, of God, the word became flesh and made his dwelling among us. And we have seen his glory, the glory of the one and only who came from the Father, full of grace and truth. Now this passage starts just like the passage in Genesis 1.1. It says, in the beginning. But it gives us a little different perspective on the familiar creation story. And it reminds us a little bit about what was said in that earlier story. You know, in verses 1 through 3 in this passage, it tells us that Jesus was there from the beginning, and everything was created through him. If you go back to the Genesis account, it's interesting to read that when God was creating and when God was getting ready to create man, it says that he said, let us create man. Let us create man in our own image. We read, uh, in, we read in those verses also that the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. God was there, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. He was there, creating, making. And Jesus was there from the beginning. He didn't just pop up one day in a manger in Bethlehem. He was there from the beginning. Verses 4 and 5 and verse 9 remind us that Jesus has always been the source of light and life. People love lights at Christmas time. You know, it becomes a festival of lights, a season of lights, all the lights around. A great reminder, as long as we remember that we're pointing to the one who is the light. Jesus has always been the light and the life of mankind from when breath was breathed into us and we became alive to the life that we have because of what he's done for us as we come alive again, just as he breathed on his disciples and said that they should have life in him. Verses 10 through 14, Jesus' coming was not something new. This was not something in the moment. This was not a response to the moment. Jesus' coming was not new. It was planned from long ago. It was planned from the beginning. You know, Jesus, we see in this, was there from the beginning, and, and Advent was just his coming to us. Advent means the coming of something. And his advent, his, it was his coming to us. Not that he wasn't there, but his coming to us. Just as his second advent, he who is already there, will be coming again. Coming again. Not his coming into being, but his coming to us. His coming for a purpose. His coming for the plan and purpose of God. And in Bethlehem, Jesus was indeed born of a woman, becoming like us. He put on skin and became just like us. To go through all the things that, the, that we experience, to be able to live as we live, and to be an appropriate sacrifice for us. But he himself was the Ancient of Days. I love it in Scripture when it says he was talking with the Pharisees and uh, they ask him about why he speaks the way he does, and he says, Abraham was delighted to see my day. And they say, how can you talk about Abraham? You're 30 years old. And he said, before Abraham was, I am. I am. He was the ancient of days. So Christmas for us is the remembrance of Jesus' birthday. Yes, he did put on skin to walk among us. He did become Emmanuel. He did become like us. And, and so we celebrate Jesus and we remember it as his birthday, putting on that skin and coming the first time. And we celebrate birthdays by giving gifts, right? but we usually give them to the one being born. I always thought that was kind of funny anyway. I thought, really, on your birthday, you probably ought to give a gift to your mom, you know? 
That would be much more appropriate. Thanks, Mom. You know, that, that would be much more. But we give gifts to the one that was born because we like to celebrate them. You know, we like to celebrate that they're here. I like to tell people, hey, man, I'm, I'm glad God made you. I'm glad you're in my life. And so we celebrate them and we, we give them a gift. But in this case, he was the gift. As he was born and as he came for us, he was the gift. And as John says, that gift was for us. In the passage we just read, it said, To all who received him, to those who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. What a gift. What a gift that was wrapped up in those little blankets and things that night and laid in a manger. It's amazing. All of that is probably familiar to you, but here's what I want you to see clearly today. We recognize God's divine attributes, right? When we think about God, we talk about his greatness, and we talk about the, the three omnis of God, right? God is omnipotent. That means he's all-powerful. We talk about God being omnipresent. That means he's everywhere at once, right? He just fills all the space. He's there. And we talk about one more of those that is God's omniscience. Being omniscient means that God knows everything from beginning to end. There is no time for him. He doesn't have to wait to see things unfold the way that we do. God knows from the beginning to the end. He is omniscient. He knows it all. Now, the reason I bring that up, why that is so important is, do you think that God was surprised by what happened in the garden? Absolutely not. You know, one of my favorite parts of that story is when he comes into the garden, he says, Adam, where are you? You know, like anybody could really hide from God. But he was calling to him to have him come to him. But God was not surprised by what happened in the garden. Before he said, let us make man in our image, God knew what was going to happen. So the beauty of that is that he knew it and he did it anyway. That's amazing. Would you? If you knew, if you knew ahead of time, I'm going to create this in all of its beauty and its splendor and its wonder, and I'm going to create people, and I'm going to have my fellowship with them, and I'm going to walk with them in the garden in the cool of the day, and then they're going to turn around and they're going to betray me. They're going to reject me. They're going to reject my love and care and concern for them and think that I've lied to them, and instead they're going to lie to me and pursue their own path and bring about all that's going to happen. Would you? But he knew, and he knew what it would cost to fix it, and he was still willing to do it. That's why we read the verse that everybody knows so well that says, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son, that whoever believes in him should not perish, but have eternal life. Love. That's the driving force behind the story. And again, as I think about other religions that are so much about, you know, people trying to pursue God or trying to be good enough or trying to work their way there, trying to do the epic quest so that they can prove they're worthy of grace, of salvation, of, of forgiveness, of immortality, of whatever it is, that's all a bunch of bunk. But the story is that it's God's love, and God's love is the story. You know, John writes, and he says, God is love. It's what emanates from him. It's his, his character, his nature. As we become like him, we become loving as well. But the whole story of the Bible, the whole story of the gospel, is a story that God loves us so much. He was willing to do that, to create us, to have fellowship with us, willing, knowing that we were going to do what we would do, and what it would cost him in his own son and sacrifice sacrifice and he loved us enough to do it anyway so that eventually we could be with him we can't overlook that in the story God has other traits that are singular to him his holiness is amazing you know that is a distinct attribute of God his righteousness his judgment his justice his mercy but his love is what underrides it all it's what's behind and in and through the whole story is the love of God that he has for us. And so he knew what was going on. In fact, we can see that so clearly if we go to the end of the book. And we look in Revelation 13, 8, which refers to Jesus as the lamb that was slain from the foundation of the world. 
Why? Because God knew what it was going to take from the first day that he began to speak things into existence. From the foundations of the world, the sacrifice was prepared. The lamb was ready. It was just a matter of being in the fullness of his time. This is the Christmas story. Christmas being about Christ. It's his story. This is that story. And the Christmas story is everybody's story. It's everyone's story. and Everyone is in the story. They just don't realize it. Everyone is in the story. It's about us. And it began from the beginning, and it began in the heart and in the love of God and the love that he has for us. And so as we, we read earlier, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. He went ahead. He spoke it into being. He crafted and created. And it says he formed us. He formed man out of the dust of the ground and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. That's why the psalmist later wrote in Psalm 24 and verse 1 that the earth is the Lord's and everything in it and the world and all who live in it. Why? Because he made it all out of love and passion and, and creative desire. He created it all wonderful and beautiful and fantastic, and it all belongs to him. We belong to him. And we're accountable to him in that. That's why in Romans 1, we read where Paul writes in Romans 1.20, he says, For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse. We are accountable to him before him. Mankind chose to rebel, sin, rejection of God's order, God's divine authority, God's right. And yet God, who could have destroyed us in the moment, said, no, I'm going to preserve you and provide a way to redeem you and bring you back and make things right with you. But we stand accountable before him. And so he's provided the gift and given it to us and given us opportunity to receive it. And he comes by the Holy Spirit and he prompts and provokes and he says, hey, I'm here and here it is. He provokes us to take it, and we're accountable before him, and we will be accountable for what we have done with that gift. That's why we read in Philippians chapter 2 about Jesus. It says, Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped or held on to, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant and being made in human likeness. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient to death, even death on a cross. Therefore God exalted him to the highest place and gave him the name that is above every name, that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. See, all of this is the story. And Jesus came and he took that form of a servant and took that humble role and died in our places to sacrifice to provide for us. And when he comes again, it will be that time of giving account and accountability. I offered you this gift. What have you done with it? Did you accept it? Have you applied it into your life? I allowed my grace to come and redeem you. Because he's working towards a conclusion. That end of the book that you would have been tempted to peek at. Because in Revelation 21 and verse 3, it says, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them, and they will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. That's when all the tears are gone, all the pain, all the suffering, all the earthquakes, all the stuff that gets destroyed, all of it gone. As we live with him in the joy and peace and harmony that he created us for. And that's the story. And it's the Christmas story. It's wonderful to look at the manger in Bethlehem, and we look at it and we say, oh, it's sweet. It's a baby, and it's wonderful, and it's baby Jesus. All of that is great and wonderful, but we've got to remember from the beginning, that baby was the lamb slain from the foundations of the world because God loves us. Because God loves us, and he gave everything in the very best that he had to give, and it started from the beginning. 
I don't know what your traditions are for Christmas and what you do for fun. I mean, there's a lot of things we've done as a family for fun. We've hidden gifts and left notes, you know, where they have to track it down and find out where it is if they want to open it, you know. Uh, probably one of the most fun things is when you buy something for somebody way in advance, right? And so you've got it, you know, because you knew just the right thing. And so you got a gift. And then you have to hide it out. And to me, the best hiding places are right in front of their nose, you know, because they just don't notice, you know. It just, phew, it's gone. But it's awesome when you get those gifts, you know, because you're hardest for them and you find just the right thing and so you have it and you stash it and it's there and and you're waiting for that right moment of time when you can bring it out and you can give it to them and you can see the joy and and all that goes along with that and so you know even in those traditions that we have in Christmas even in the fun that we have at Christmas in that that moment that we share you know that's what God has done for us in Jesus that's what that baby in the manger was all about it was that gift, that treasure that God wrapped up and hid in the form of a little baby that people could even pass by and not even notice. It's right in front of your face. And yet in the fullness of time, that was the gift that he was giving. The ultimate gift that all of us need so desperately. And so we find ourselves in Christmas time and we have an opportunity in this Advent season to be touched again, hopefully, by this story, by the story, and to be filled afresh and anew in our hearts with the love of God that he so much desires to pour into us, with the presence of Jesus, Emmanuel, God with us, to be filled with that presence once again, to be refreshed by him, and life that we have through the Holy Spirit. That's what this Advent season is all about. That's why we go back to the readings and the prophecies and the scripture about the promise and we light the candles as we think about that and, and you even see the note in the bulletin about preparation for Jesus and it's like, well, he's already come, right? I've already been there, done that, right? If you're not drinking that in fresh and new, you need to. You need to. And we have an opportunity this season to be touched by that again and to drink in that story once again and to be refreshed and renewed by it. And we have the opportunity this Advent season to tell that story to ears and to hearts that are aching to hear just such a message of love, peace, joy, and hope that we have in him. Tell me the story. Tell me the story. They need to hear the story. Would you stand with me this morning? I want to pray with you and for you this morning. We're going to sing a couple of more songs as we worship him together today. I'm going to pray with you right now, and, and I want to take time as well to, to pray for you this morning. I want to make sure we understand this week by week as we do this. We do want to pray for you and lay hands on you and pray with you about things that you have going on in your life, whether it's physical emotional, financial, whatever the needs are that you're facing. We do make time for that in the service. During this next song, you have an opportunity to come forward here. We'll meet you up here. I'm here at the front. We have some, some folks that, that are ready to pray with others as they come forward as well. If you have a need this morning, please step out during this next song and come forward. We'll pray with you this morning and uh, make, make the most of this time and opportunity. Let's pray together right now. Father, thank you again, Lord, for the awesome privilege to be a part of your family, to be one of your kids. You came that whoever would believe and receive would have the right to become a child of God. What a gift. Lord, may we receive that gift. May it bring joy to our heart again as we realize, Lord, even as our homes and our things have been shaken, there's very little we can really hold on to that has value. But God, you've given us something that no one can take away. God, you've given us something that can't be shaken, broken, stolen, any of that. Lord, you've given us the right to become children of God something we can hold on to and possess to eternity to get to be your kids. Lord, may it fill us with joy and peace and the hope that you intended us to, Lord, as we look forward, even in the midst of the frustration and the now, to the beauty of the not yet and what you're desiring to do. Lord, may we be comforted in the now by your presence with us and may we press hard into that in the moments that we're afraid, in the moments that we are grieved, in the moments that we are overwhelmed and pressed. Lord, may we find what we need in you, Lord, to get through the moment and to keep pressing on. 
Father, I pray that you would refresh us today in all that comes with this wonderful story. May it be new to us again in our hearts and our minds. And Lord, may it be so fresh with joy in us that we're ready to share that same story with those who need to hear. Father, we thank you for it. Thank you for your awesome love, your grace and mercy in Jesus Christ. And it says, in his name we pray. Amen.